Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, start in about a minute. Um, I'm just going to share my screen a minute and broadcast on Facebook and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining me. Okay, we're about to live stream and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining me um, to talk about the impact of the pandemic and natural disasters on um, individuals with developmental disabilities. My name is Dr. Maribel Del Rio Roberts um, and I am here to talk to you and share a little bit about this important topic. Um, since this is Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month, um, I thought it would be a good idea to address some of these topics that oftentimes um, do not receive um, adequate attention. Um, and so I think, you know, particularly when we're faced and we're working with vulnerable populations, um, I think it's important that sometimes they, we highlight um, some of the challenges and barriers that they themselves encounter um, when they are faced with a situation of this magnitude. Um, so I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I am an associate professor at Nova Southeastern University's Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice. And I oversee a master's in developmental disabilities as well as our Access Plus program, which is our on-campus support program for undergraduate students with autism. And I've had the opportunity throughout the past year uh, to learn a little bit more about um, some of the challenges and some of the, the significant um, hurdles that the clients that we work with and individuals in the community have faced uh, because a lot of these challenges and these issues and events have been so unexpected. Um, and so I want to start off with talking about um, the impact of the pandemic. Um, that's really what's most prevalent, prevalent in all of our minds at the present time. Um, and I think really taking a close look at our DD population or IDD population, individuals with developmental and uh, disabilities as a whole um, is going to be really important uh, because they're often what we call the forgotten population. So other groups oftentimes receive a lot of attention, whether it's the impact um, on these unforeseen circumstances on young children, on schooling, on older adults, on ourselves and our, uh, the, our ability to be effective in the workplace. But oftentimes there's not, there hasn't been a lot of research that's been put out that looks at and takes a close look at how um, our constituents with developmental disabilities have been affected. Um, and so I want to start off a little bit talking a little bit about what we do know. And so what do we know about COVID-19 and the pandemic and what how that's impacted and affected, um, you know, our, our the clients that we work with or the individuals in our lives that might be presenting with an intellectual or developmental disability. So according to the World Health Organization, um, individuals with developmental disabilities or disabilities in general are at a higher risk uh, for contracting COVID-19. Um, and they do tend to have higher rates of mortality. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about why that's the case later on. Um, children and adults with developmental disabilities are facing disproportionate burdens linked to the pandemic. We're also going to address what some of those burdens are. 
Um, there is public awareness of some of the challenges that are imposed by the pandemic, uh, particularly on um, the disabled population. However, uh, the impact on the family or um, you know, a person with such disabilities can often go unrecognized even by individuals because sometimes they're not able to express or verbalize some of the distress or some of the challenges or identify uh, what their own barriers have been um, at the present time. So I think these are all things that we're gonna mull over. And finally, mitigation and social distancing can aggravate the social isolation that has been experienced by many individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that's what we know as a whole and things that we know are certain, um, but there's a lot more that is more vague and unknown. And because there hasn't been, um, you know, we're, we're now into our first year in this process and we haven't experienced a pandemic in our lifetime um, before, you know, I think that there's not a lot of there's not a lot of research, there's not a lot of procedures and practices and best practices in place to support our um, the individuals with developmental disabilities, whether you know that ranges the gamut from childhood all the way through um, older adulthood. So when we talk about risk, um, what we know that there are certain populations that are at increased risk. So we know that young children might be at increased risk maybe for transmission because they don't necessarily wear their PPE um, appropriately, but they may not necessarily be as affected when it comes to um, the physical symptoms. We know older adults are uh, significantly impacted by COVID-19. But what do we really know about um, individuals in general with developmental disabilities and the impact um, of the pandemic and having to deal with a long-term, this being a long-term situation. So according to the World Health Organization, um, you know, we do know that people with disabilities do contract COVID-19 at a higher rate. Um, and some of those factors that lead to that is that they may not be able to follow preventive measures such as social distancing, um, as well as may be advised by some of our governmental or state local agencies. Um, so they require support, so they might not understand the importance of doing so. Um, so the inability to follow so preventive measure measures might, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why some of that might be, particularly the social distancing piece in a bit. Um, we also have, you know, that they may face barriers to accessing information about the pandemic in general. So oftentimes information is presented in very, um, you know, statistical or technical terms at times. We have a lot of um, physicians, professionals that go on TV, which may be their primary outlet uh, to obtain information. But just because the information is being disseminated and they may have access to it, via television or maybe even via the internet, it doesn't mean that they're fully understanding or assimilating what the, what the implications of this information, what it means and how it affects them directly. Um, so it's really important to understand also that because a lot of times people with developmental disabilities have pre-existing conditions. They oftentimes, because of their developmental disability itself, they might have might be prone to chronic heart disease or they might have respiratory issues. Um, that that places them already, they're already more vulnerable. Medically, they might be more fragile and more vulnerable. And in addition to that, if there's an intellectual disability that is also you know present at simultaneously, that's going to aggravate and make it much more, um, put place them at higher risk uh, for contracting the virus. People with disabilities are overrepresented in institutions, um, and that's another risk factor. Uh, things like assisted learning, learning facilities, um, nursing homes, um, and so that's something else that we need to um, keep in mind. Um, People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are also overrepresented in um, correction facilities or detention facilities. Um, and so we know that in these types of facilities, there's the transmission rate is much quicker 
Um, so I think that that's another aspect to be aware of. So, you know, a lot of times we, that when we watch TV and we see on the news, there's a big emphasis or focus on senior living facilities. But what about group homes and ALFs where a lot of our um, participants or a lot of our constituents that we work with are often, you know, where they're often residing. Um, and that doesn't receive as much attention. So I think that's another um, aspect to, to keep in mind as well. Um, I'm sorry, it seems like, and I'm going to just pause for a minute because I wanted to try to stream on Facebook. But anyway, I don't know that that's that's going to work. So we'll just continue. Um, uh, we'll make it available. Um, so again, um, you know, I think when we look at this systemically, just from a, a systemic point of view, are the people that are in charge that are supposed to protect us that are supposed to protect the most vulnerable, including people with developmental disabilities? Are they really are they on their radar? Are they really taking the precautions? Um, that are necessary to protect them from, you know, ultimately risk. Um, so there are other factors um, that also contribute to an increase in risk of infection. Um, part of that also includes different physical problems, social circumstances, and limitations and understanding um, as a whole. So there's a whole gamut of complex dynamic factors that interplay. Um, the prevalence of comorbid physical disorders is higher among people with intellectual disabilities and other developmental disabilities, so that makes their life expectancy lower. And we've seen, as with some states, they've started to prioritize, for example, uh, people with Down syndrome. Um, and the reason for that is that people with Down syndrome have a tendency to, um, one of the associated features of Down syndrome is uh, chronic or enlarged heart or heart problems. So because of that, they've been moved up, you know, and made a priority population. But I think that there are other uh, disabilities that are being overlooked. Um, people with genetic disorders or other types of disabilities can also suffer, suffer from met metabolic or respiratory conditions. Um, and we have to think about um, you know, their ability to protect themselves. If you have a person that has a, a significant intellectual disability, are they going to understand that they have to keep their mask on and why it's important to wear a mask and why they can't sit close to their caregiver or, you know, a, a paid caregiver that might come into the home. And so they don't always understand all of those barriers that they shouldn't put their hand in their mouth and then touch another person. And so all of this creates not only increased risk for the person with a disability themselves, but also for family and caregivers as well. Um, there also is an increased risk of obesity among people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and because of that, we know that obesity is a risk factor for um, severe, severe presentation of COVID-19. So again, these are all factors that contribute to these, the, their risk of infection and their susceptibility and vulnerability. Um, and overall, just the presence of having comorbid mental health issues can also make the person uh, more at risk. So aside from health factors, there are also social factors. Um, one of those could be um, you know, a lot of times, aside from living in these group homes or these uh, assisted living facilities, um, these are congregated settings. Um, and so, you know, at this point in time, there's probably been a system to, you know, as with facilities for older adults, to take precautions. But I think that it can be challenging because oftentimes people with intellectual and developmental disabilities might be more mobile. Um, than an older adult might be. And so that creates some challenges as well. Um, and sometimes they do present with other, other problematic behaviors such as aggression um, where they might need to be restrained. Um, and so if they are needing to be restrained by a, a, a person that's care, care taking for, of them, then at that point, you know, there's a risk of close contact um, and that can put them at risk as well. 
Um, many might live with family members who are either an elderly parent um, whose health status itself might be compromised. Um, and, you know, they just overall, there's a higher need for levels of support from family members, from care, paid caregivers. So if you have respite um, or allied support workers that come into the home, um, you know, and are consistently maybe rotating on some sort of schedule, you're increasing the risk of susceptibility and of exposure as well, even when precautions are taken. So in terms of the impact on uh, the developmentally disabled, um, based on their level of functioning, they require differing levels of support. And some of them might be able to live independently in the community and other must, others might have to reside in residential facilities. Um, but it means that in some way, either directly or indirectly, they're being impacted by not only the risk associated with contracting COVID-19, but all the other extra, ex, extraordinary factors, social, emotional, and the limitations that are affiliated with the pandemic. Um, those that tend to have milder intellectual disabilities that function more independently are less likely to require as intensive supports uh, compared to those that have more moderate or severe levels of intellectual disability. Um, so they might be more participatory in community activities, which might also lead to paid employment, but that in itself also presents some challenges as well um, in terms of making sure that there's consistency in the safeguards and the procedures and the protocols that they're following to ensure that they're not putting themselves at risk. Conversely to that, um, for those that are more significantly impaired, if they do contract COVID-19, their ability to um, identify and maybe to even verbalize what they're feeling, whether it's, you know, whatever physical distress or feelings they might be experiencing could be compromised. Um, might, might not, they might not be able to do so. Um, and so because of that, that the diagnosis um, becomes very challenging, particularly if you have a, a person that is uncooperative, that they are not going to cooperate and go to a testing site and allow someone to swab their nose or swab their mouth. Um, there are some significant challenges with that. At what point do then they need to incorporate restraints? What site, what site do you take them to that would offer that type of um, that type of um, supports in order to get testing. And the same with vaccinations as well. Um, people with IDD often tend to follow their own routines, right? And so when something changes, something as some, some impactful as a pandemic, where our lives have basically been uprooted and we've had to change the way that we do things, um, you know, at first these sudden changes can increase their levels of anxiety because it does for it does for all of us, um, and so this will lead or could lead to an increase in behavioral challenges and potential mental health concerns. Um, you know, there are I've I've had the opportunity to talk with several adults over the past year um, that have you know are either employed, gainfully employed, or wanting to be employed, or just have, you know, been impacted by a lot of the um, safeguarding measures that have been put in place. And I can think of one particular situation where there's an adult with an intellectual disability who is residing with an, an elderly, a very elderly parent. Um, and now he's feeling the pressure um, because they feel like his you know, he had their, the family is saying he hasn't done enough for his parent, that he hasn't gone to get the parent vaccinated, that he hasn't done enough to, um, to protect the parent. And he feels overwhelmed and that he's just doing the best that he can. So not only is the pressure on the caregivers, but once the caregivers become older, there could be, you know, there could be a role reversal there um, that can place additional stress on the person. So these are all very complex uh, dynamics that sometimes we don't always necessarily think about um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so in times of the pandemic, people with 
um, a developmental disability are probably likely to have difficulty advocating for themselves. Um, and they have to rely on other people to keep them safe, particularly if there are communication uh, impairments in communication um, or there are some sort of um, severe significant behavioral challenges or um, disturbances that accompany the disability. Um, oftentimes they may not have access to acquiring masks. Um, they might not be able to go on the internet and order um, you know, masks for themselves. They might not know where to locate um, a vaccination site or where to go get tested if they're not feeling well, um, aside from maybe calling, maybe calling someone, a family member. Um, so, you know, those who function in the community with little support, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, their adherence to measures could be variable. And is that really affecting the, you know, helping to reduce a spread or augmenting it? Um, and sometimes it's con conversely to that. It's the, the, the opposite of that. So sometimes there's a lack of understanding, but there's also an over preoccupation and adherence to cleaning protocols to the point where it becomes obsessive. And the person doesn't want to leave the home because they've developed such a fear and a phobia of contracting COVID-19 because they don't realize that washing your hands for 20 seconds should be good enough. Um, and so they might engage in all of these complex rituals that they might have already been susceptible to or vulnerable to anyway. Um, so it might, you know, in, in, in this process, it can be difficult for caregivers, um, you know, to limit certain freedoms, uh, particularly when it pertains to the person's day-to-day -day routines or day-to-day -day activities. For example, a person with autism, if you change their routine in any way that could create a source of stress, particularly if the routines are frequently changing. Um, you know, maybe their, their respite worker, the, their therapist is no longer wanting to work with them because they wanna take precautions or they've become ill and they have to send someone to substitute them in their place. That creates a lot of challenges and distress um, for a person that has issues with adaptability and flexibility. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, again, they may become overly focused and overwhelmed and maybe for a higher functioning person, they become preoccupied to the point where they spend hours consuming information, whether it's through television outlets or, new, or the internet. Um, and it almost becomes an obsession to the exclusion of other activities. Um, and again, it can heighten anxiety and trigger anxiety in other areas. And sometimes even you see um, the onset of paranoid behavior um, because of the, the push to, um, to engage in social distancing, it can often then lead to a little bit of paranoia where it's not, no longer safe. They, know, they feel no one is safe anymore. Um, even once maybe you know, the threat has passed. Um, so in terms of um, some of the challenges um, in supporting people that do, do contract COVID-19, um, how do we best support them? Um, and, you know, there's really not a lot that's known about the rate of infection in communities um, in many countries uh, because no one's really keeping, not, there are not too many people that are keeping track of this. Um, I did come across some data in certain states. Um, Oregon has been really proactive in um, methodical and keeping data um, on developmental disabilities and specifically, but there, there aren't a lot of states that are actually keeping track of um, rates of infection and vaccination for this particular population. Um, and so we know that there's evidence of harm in elderly people, um, you know, when it comes to COVID-19. So if there, it's an elderly person with a developmental disability, we know that those challenges are going to be, you know, magnified. Um, and so even with the out inpatient, you would think, you know, not only for people living in the community at large, um, you know, in but even in inpatient settings where it's easier, you have a captive audience to keep track of some of this data, um, a, not a lot has been done at the present to look at the specific impacts and rates of infection um, and recovery. 
more mortality um, in uh, our our constituents with developmental disabilities. Um, and there's a lot of strain that's also placed on care staff um, and caregivers in general, but particularly for those that work in uh, assisted living facilities or independent living facilities. Um, you know, they are expected to acquire new skills and that, that are sometimes even practiced by nurses or more skilled uh, medical professionals um, to help, you know, to help care for uh, people who are ill and then again, putting themselves at risk. Um, so practices such as infection control measures um, are, you know, that are often implemented to try to minimize the risk is important, but we have to keep in mind how these practices are going to affect and how the people that we work with are going to respond to these practices and how we can maybe modify them or tweak them. Um, so particularly, you know, applying these measures can be a challenge um, for someone who doesn't understand the importance of it. I mean, I can tell you we have people with that don't that are not developmentally disabled that sometimes don't understand the importance of taking precautions. So for a person with a disability, they might not necessarily see, you know, the the risk, the sense of urgency to engage in these, you know, behaviors, particularly because of you know, the length of time that we've had to continue to, uh, um, to adhere to them. Um, services may be challenged as well. So if there's a staff member that's absent due to illness <laughs> and that, <coughs> excuse me, that staff member might need to self-isolate, that's going to create some disturbance um, in the routine and the day-to-day -day life of the person. <coughs> and then access to personal protective equipment you know, at several at different points in time, um, has been a challenge because of different global shortages. So there are lots of challenges that we can bring up and talk about, but these tend to be some of the more prominent uh, challenges um, that have come up in the literature. Um, so let's talk a little bit. We've talked a little bit about the impact of the pandemic and COVID nineteen. Um, you know in a variety of different areas. But one of the areas that seems to be most affected is mental health. Um, so not only, you know, is there stress related to contracting the illness, to adherence, adhering to social distancing and quarantine, uh, but they, they do impact the mental health of some people. So I can tell you that I had the opportunity um, in the last couple of months um, to lead, particularly towards the beginning of the pandemic last year, um, to lead a support group for athletes uh, that participate in Special Olympics Florida. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of them were self-reporting a lot of emotional distress <laughs> because participating in these activities, in these sports, was their social outlet. It was their way of coping with whatever challenges that they were being presented with, um, you know, emotionally or just on a day-to-day -day basis. So having that removed and the inability to be able to not only practice a sport that they love, but also to engage in that camaraderie with their teammates, with their coaches, I think that was also, that was also had huge detrimental impacts. And oftentimes, you know, the impact on mental health in our IDD population, it's often overlooked. And we assume that because they're delayed that they're just going to adjust and go along with it. Um, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, a lot of them have experienced, a lot of people have experienced a lot of significant distress. Um, and so, you know, to, aside from the fact that, you know, having to quarantine and not being able, having routines change, not being able to engage in activities that they enjoy have been affected and for a substantial period of time, um, they, they may be even more adversely affected uh, because some of these restrictions trigger some of their problem behaviors, whether it's maybe compulsive repetitive behaviors or maybe it's self-soothing or self-injurious behavior. Um, <clears throat> or it might be acting out um, to try to uh, obtain some sort of 
response um, from other people. So there are many different reasons, but a lot of times problem behaviors are exacerbated. Um, for example, autism or ADHD in a person with an intellectual disability can worsen the situation. So again, placing restrictions or changing the structure on which a person thrives has some pretty detrimental consequences. Um, and then you have the factor that sometimes caregivers of people with IDD may need to self-isolate and that breaks down the, the care person's network. So what if you have a caregiver, a parent, let's say, that's caring for a young adult with a developmental disability in the home and that person contracts, the parent contracts COVID-19 and they have to self-isolate to not risk exposing, you know, if they don't have a strong support network what do they do at that point if they don't have a respite worker, if they don't have paid help, if they don't have a, a family support network or friends nearby that are able to step in, um, that really not only, you know, that can pose substantial strain on the caregiver, but also put the person with a disability at, at risk. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of factors um, at play. Um, there's an important aspects of all of this, which relates to access to information. Um, and part of, you know, one of the major barriers or challenges is that information oftentimes is not tailored to be uh, disseminated or to or received by a person with a developmental disability, specifically an intellectual disability. Um, so we assume that we're putting out the information to the lay person, maybe at a sixth to eighth grade level of understanding, but that doesn't ensure that a person with a cognitive disability is going to understand what that means. Um, and so understanding rates of infection, understanding the numbers and the statistics, all of that might be completely over their heads. And so is there someone or some some entity that can help provide that guidance and that clarity. Um, you know, oftentimes they rely on others to help them gain their information. Um, they might have ex they might have access to um, the internet, but they might use it purely for recreational purposes. They might not know how to access important information via the internet, um, and so. How do we make sure that, particularly if it's a person that's living independently, um, that they're getting the information and that they have the supports that they need? Um, and also providing accessible information to caregivers, um, especially, again, where literacy is limited. Um, so not only, you know, depending on the news outlets, but uh, you know, a lot of I know nonprofit organizations that serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities have made it a point to try to uh, provide the information in a in a way that's most um, easily assimilated by the person or understood. But if that person and the family aren't necessarily affiliated to certain organizations or support networks, that might not happen. So lack of um, access to information is going to create barriers to adherence. Um, and so again, you know, part of it might be due to uh, living in congregated settings or living independently, or, um, you know, <coughs> part of it might be just their inability to be flexible. Um, you know, when we're stressed, when we're pushed to our limits, I know I, you know, we all get to certain points where we experience that pandemic fatigue, where we all wish that we didn't have to do these things anymore. Um, and so to, to present or to have a person with a disability that already experiences and has a lower level of tolerance for stress to begin with, and then to put them in a situation of chronic stress when you don't really know when that stressor is going to be alleviated, um, or is no longer going to be in the picture can create substantial challenges um, when it comes to adherence. Um, quarantine is going to be difficult for a person. So for a person with an IDD, maybe they maybe they were exposed potentially to 
COVID. Um, and so they are asked to quarantine. That might not be so easy to adhere to for them um, because they don't understand how their behavior might be putting someone else at risk. Um, and again, the importance of tailoring and creating equity in access to information um, is extremely important um, because when people are presented with information in a manner that they understand, they're more likely to be able to um, adhere to it and that, that's when you decrease some of these barriers. So not only are the individuals with a disability themselves impacted, but caregivers and family members are also impacted as well. Um, you know, the impact in general when it comes to families and caregivers is heightened, especially when they rely on maybe residential schools or day treatment facilities or uh, respite care that for, at certain points in time were not operational or were not were closed down. Um, and so having to make accommodations for that um, created some, some significant challenges. Um, support from local authorities and government agencies, um, you know, particularly, you know, for a parent that maybe has to work, um, you know, and maybe they're, they're, they were sending their young adult to a day treat training center um, on a regular basis and that they weren't able to do that for a period of time. How does that impact their day to day? Are they able to keep their jobs if they don't have access to respite support um, or someone else to come in and, and provide care for the person? Um, and ultimately the impact on finances um, and overall well being and mental health. Um, you know, there is an increase when you have a person with a disability that either because of either they're might be struggling um, with understanding some of the limitations and some of the, the uh, protocols that need to be followed and why, um, or you know, just the result of not being able to engage in their day-to-day -day activities. Maybe again, they were an athlete in Special Olympics or they, were employed uh, part-time and maybe they were laid off because of financial issues with the pandemic. And that disrupts their day-to-day -day and their way of life that can create um, some challenges for families and knowing how to best support that person um, through that process. So let's talk a little bit about what are some of the social implications um, because of some of the behavioral and um, mental health uh, challenges that sometimes are exacerbated um, as a result of all of this stress. Um, you know, people with disabilities are more vulnerable to psychological and social issues. Um, so to begin with, they're more likely to experience loneliness or isolation um, because they might not necessarily, once they, are graduated from high school and they don't obtain, maybe they haven't been able to obtain or not capable of obtaining any sort of gainful employment or participating in any sort of structured environment where there's abilities to socialize, that can lead to loneliness and isolation. And oftentimes, you know, that loneliness and isolation can lead to poorer health outcomes. Um, the person becomes more inactive, which can lead to increases in obesity and other health problems as well. Um, women with disabilities and women who care for people with disabilities are at greater risk for domestic abuse and sexual violence during pandemics. Um, and we know that the incidents of domestic violence, um, you know, for a period of time, there was some attention that was being brought to light in terms of the risk for increase in domestic violence within the general population. Um, so imagine for people that are already in a vulnerable position, how much more so that's magnified or intensified. Um, and they may be unable to access reproductive care. Um, and so they, or just general health care. Um, so they might have some disadvantages when it comes to the pandemic. Um, children with disabilities are at higher risk for mental distress as well. So I've been talking a little bit about um, 
more so focusing on adults just because children oftentimes to some extent or capacity have been supported um, in some way by the educational system. Um, so they do get some sort of consistent access or supports, um, but they themselves do face, particularly when that access to the educational system, there, if there was a lapse in that, um, or during the period of time of virtual education or virtual learning, um, where even children with ESE, although they've been prioritized, um, to return to in-person learning, um, you know, during the time that that wasn't a possibility, there was some significant um, challenges that came about with, of that, um, or as a result of that. So, you know, there are many children, as we know, um, that do suffer or are identified as having a developmental disability. Um, in about 2016, about 52 million children, uh, there were about 52 million children that were younger than the age of five with some form of a developmental disability. So that averages out to about one in six children in the United States, um, whether it's a communication and attention, um, some sort of neurodevelopmental disability, uh, physical or um, sensory disability, but one in six children have been identified as having um, a disability. Um, and so children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, particularly those with ASD, are more likely to experience anxiety and stress and other ill effects as a result. Um, and they may be particularly sensitive to changes in routine, such as school closures, maybe their therapies are, have, were interrupted at different points in time. Um, and so, and the lack of opportunities to socialize. So we know that social interaction um, is often one of the core weaknesses of autism spectrum disorder. And so when you take out the opportunities to generalize or practice some of the skills that they may have been, been taught, that also creates some regression and some challenges um, as well. Um, so just to kind of revert a little bit back to the topic of um, intellectual, uh, intellectual disability and mental health, um, and I, I touched a little bit about on this in the, in the previous um, slides, but there are a lot of different conditions that can be exacerbated um, that are already present. So for example, people with autism spectrum disorder have a high prevalence of associated features of obsessive and compulsive behaviors. Um, and so a lot of times those obsessions or intrusive thoughts or those compulsions are exacerbated by emotional distress. Um, and because of any sort of increased anxiety that might be experienced due to the changes. Um, uh, let's see. And um, sometimes what happens is that, you know, particularly in a child that might not be verbal, um, you know, they might be, if they are receiving services, maybe they're receiving behavioral interventions, the behaviors might be targeted and might be the focus of treatment, but the actual root cause of those behaviors might not necessarily, the child might not be able to verbalize those. Um, and so at that point, you see a continuation and it's, it appears as though the treatment is not progressing. Um, and it really might be because there are other factors at play, for example, some of these other things that we've talked about related to changes in routine, lack of access to social interaction, um, and increases in anxiety and stress that might be contributing to some of the behavioral challenges. So how, when we think about the big picture, for example, a provider like myself that provides a specialized clinical service, um, we need, we as providers need to be able to adapt to the changing environment um, in which we deliver so services. So I can tell you, I know many mental health providers or practitioners that had to quit very quickly adjust to a telehealth modality, but that might not always be as simple to, to carry out with a person with a disability, um, particularly if there are intellectual uh, deficits that accompany that disability. 
Um, and so again, changing sometimes the change of, well, I used to see, your in, see you in your office every week. Why can't I go see you in your office? That might create a lot of barriers and a lot of anxiety in the person when it comes to adjusting to um, receiving services via a new modality. And so the use of technology can be very beneficial, um, but at the same time, the person oftentimes may require, depending on their level of independent and cognitive functioning, might require some additional supports in order to make that happen. But we have to make sure that we as specialized providers are being flexible and adjusting to and making sure that we're meeting the needs and not assuming that the person is going to be able to hop onto the portal, log into the waiting room, and you're going to be able to interact with them as fluidly as you would with a person that doesn't have a disability. So making sure that the time is taken to provide them with the instructions ahead of time and giving them opportunities to practice will be important. So when we talk about some of these issues, we have to talk about advanced care planning um, because like in, in any situation and any related to any medical issue, but particularly when there's something sudden like maybe an infectious disease, um, there is a risk of death. Um, and this can create you know, a, a challenge to caregivers and family members. Um, and so advanced care planning assists families and caregivers to prepare for this particular circumstance when and where, when it and if it were to occur. So having conversations, and these are going to be difficult conversations because they are difficult in any situation or circumstance, but particularly with someone whose level of understanding might be affected, um, you know, to talk about their perception and wishes on their end of life care. So we want to know what, how you feel about some of these issues. What are your wishes for end of life care? And having these collaborative discussions between caregivers and the person is going to ultimately lead to less stress and anxiety were the situation to arise. Um, and again, treatment escalation plans are essential um, to really be able to recognize when the need for greater medical care is needed. And that's one of the biggest challenges with our IDD population is knowing when, when is this just goes beyond something that can be treated at home, especially if the person is nonverbal or unable to uh, communicate their level of uh, distress. And so having some clearly identified indicators ahead of time and making these decisions and having these discussions helps to facilitate that process. Um, so ultimately, we don't want it to ever get to that point, right? We want to protect as many vulnerable people as possible. So in order to safeguard, um, you know, and, and put some of these um, things in place, um, you know, we have, we do have to have certain things in mind because we not only have to take into account risk of illness, but there are other things or other areas or risks that people with IDD are susceptible to. So for example, risk of harm from others. When you're in a confined situation where maybe the person with the disability is placing a lot of demands on the caregiver because of their level of distress, anxiety that they're experiencing because they, the, the, their change in routine that they've experienced. Maybe they don't understand why they need to do what they're being asked to do. That can create a lot of stress on the caregiver, which ultimately can make them put them at risk for abuse. Um, and so because there's been a rise in domestic violence in the general population, um, you know, we should be on higher alert when it comes to uh, abuse and neglect of our developmentally disabled population. Um, and um, sometimes the usual methods of assessing safety in a typical situation might not be feasible, um, you know, in this particular circumstance with a person with a disability, particularly if that person has a caregiver, a guardian that monitors their interaction. Maybe they don't feel like it's safe for them over a telehealth 
um, appointment to disclose that their, their caregiver or their family member has been physically abusing them in some way. Um, and so we always have to kind of look out for some of those warning signs and keep in mind um, that there might be other factors that are things that could be happening that are affecting um, that person. Um, and so again, collecting safeguarding information, um, you know, on allegations of abuse may be affected during the pandemic and com complicate the process later. So the way that we acquire information, the way that information is reported might be affected. Um, and so we have to think about how we can tailor that in future circumstances or situations to make sure that we are gathering um, the most accurate information um, from our vulnerable population. So what are some lessons or some things that we should keep in mind in the future? Well, um, in general, we don't still don't know a lot. The immediate effects are really unknown at this time. Um, and the long-term effects are really un unknown, even with you know unborn children. But I think there needs to be a more concerted effort to monitor people that are infected, um, particularly those with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, by collecting data and following the impacts and the adverse effects and how it affects them in general. Um, I think that's a starting point that can help us inform how to best plan for the future and how to best respond in future circumstances. Um, there's a lot of advocacy that's been going on, um, you know, in the, at the governmental and the private, uh, at the private level, um, to try to raise awareness and increase access and supports to people with disabilities. And so we talk about, you know, vaccines, and now, you know, we have access to vaccines, and that seems to be, you know, really heading in a positive direction. Um, but in general, people with developmental disabilities in many instances have not been prioritized for vaccines. Um, and so unless they have a pre-existing uh, medical condition of some sort, even though they are at higher risk and are more vulnerable, um, they're not in the necessarily in the priority group if they're not within that particular range. So there are about 16 advocacy groups that have called for um, the CDC to prioritize people with developmental disabilities to receive access to the vaccine. And at this point, really it's only been those individuals that are residing in long-term long care facilities. Uh, but those that are residing in community settings have not necessarily have had, have had access. Um, so this is definitely problematic. Um, and when we think about, um, you know, particularly access to vaccines, it's not only access, but dissemination. A lot of times, you know, our, our, um, they might have an intense fear of medical procedures, of medical personnel. Um, they might not be able to verbalize or understand what's going on. And is there a process to make vaccine accessibility and awareness be feasible and viable and, and accessible to them? Um, and I think that that really is an area where, you know, we're lacking at this point. Um, and so there are uh, different organizations that have been uh, pri advocating for prioritizing vaccinations, particularly for our DD population. Um, but really the decisions are being made at the state level. So responsiveness is going to vary from state to state. Um, and it really depends sometimes even on the county in which the person resides. Um, so there are, you know, different barriers to vaccination, um, and I've touched upon some of these, uh, but for a population that's already struggled with access to equitable health care and primary care, um, you know, on top of that, you know, you compound all of these other factors and barriers, it does create disparities um, when it comes to um, access and consumption of the vaccine. Um, so ultimately, for future directions in this area, you know, how will people with ID adjust to new, we need to think about how can we make it easier for them to adjust to this process um, without maybe 
relying more on technology or relying less so on technology, uh, depending on what meets the needs of that particular group of people that we work with um, or that we're trying to reach. Uh, but at this point in time, um, you know, much more attention, funding, research needs to be done to really take a close look at the long-term um, impacts um, in social, emotional, um, and overall quality of life um, for people affected with COVID-19 um, and just in general affected by the pandemic in general. Um, so I wanna go ahead and just talk a little bit now about natural disasters and what do we know? Because I think this is also an aspect or an area that is often overlooked. Um, and so we know that about 35 million people around the world have been displaced at some point in time because of a flood, an earthquake, a hurricane, tsunami, any other type of natural disaster. And the US is one of the countries that most frequently experiences natural disasters. Um, over the past 20 years, there have been approximately 472 weather related disasters that have occurred. Um, and so people with physical disabilities in particular, but disabilities in general, um, are highly vulnerable during a natural disaster. Um, and so, you know, they not only because of difficulties or challenges with related to physical access, but also because of uh, they lack the support system from fam. They may not have support, the adequate support system to prepare for that particular um, natural disaster if it can be forecasted or to respond to in the midst of when it's happening. So in terms of vulnerability, um, particularly those with physical disabilities are two to four times more likely um, than the general population to die or sustain injuries. Um, and obviously this is due to a higher risk because of either motor or sensory, cognitive or language impairments, um, or, you know, just their ability to prepare and evacuate. So if a person with an intellectual disability, a mild intellectual disability is living independently, and they might not necessarily be a regular consumer of news or television, they might not know that there's a hurricane coming. And so they might not adequately prepare themselves. Um, and so when we think about evacuation planning, um, it really should take into account the needs of people with disabilities in general, but um, even more specifically people with physical disabilities because there's so much more that needs to be done ahead of time to facilitate an evacuation in those circumstances, specifically related to power sources in terms of running equipment that the person might need um, or communication devices. Um, in terms of barriers to access when it comes to natural disasters, um, people with developmental disabilities are uniquely affected. Um, either sometimes some of the barriers that we encounter might be related to either being socially or logistically isolated and not having, being informed or aware. Um, maybe there's a tornado and the person is left home alone. Um, maybe, you know, there's a parent that goes off to work or, you know, family member or roommate, you know, what happens if there's an unexpected disaster or circumstance? Do they know what to do and how to respond and how to uh, protect themselves in that situation? Um, people with communication disabilities might not have access to evacuation warnings. Maybe it's someone whose person who's deaf may not hear sirens um, during an oncoming, oncoming wildfire or might not have access to emergency radios. Um, and then maybe if they are able to reach a shelter, that shelter might not have the appropriate communication accommodations like a sign language interpreter or some sort of communication device um, for a deaf or even braille materials for a blind evacuee. Um, transportation might also be an issue. If you have a person that is wheelchair bound, you need, they need to plan ahead if they don't have their own vehicle to be able to tra transport them to evacuate the situation or the, the dangerous scenario. Um, and so either they might rely on public transportation and there are barriers and obstacles at that point because sometimes those are shut down. Um, and so there has to be alternative evacuation resources um, and other plans in place um, 
particularly when it comes to transportation so that the person knows ahead of time what their backup or their alternative options are. Um, sometimes, a lot of times people with disabilities rely on their personal support networks, family, friends, paid caregivers um, for their well-being and independence. And if there's a natural disaster, the paid caregiver might not be able to come and provide the assistance that they usually do on a regular basis. And that can create some significant distress. Um, or this, you know, if the person feels abandoned and overwhelmed, they can really, you know, it can really hinder their independence in the long run. So making sure that we provide and we provide information and guidance and resources, um, again, access to information is really important um, and having a plan ahead of time. And we're going to talk a little bit about evacuation plans in a bit. Um, but, you know, again, making sure that people with disabilities are involved in the conversation. Oftentimes we make decisions about this group of people without involving them in the conversation and identifying and getting a sense of what their needs are, what their challenges that they experience are. So when we talk about, um, you know, the impact on people with disabilities in general, it's also important to highlight, you know, the particular subset of population of children um, and what are some risk factors that they encounter specifically. Um, families caring for a child with disability are most vulnerable um, to, to um, harm in a pandemic because oftentimes they tend to be more vulnerable when it comes to social, structural, or financial disadvantage. Um, maybe the social context is also problematic. Maybe there's not a strong support network. Um, and so, you know, it's important to, particularly if we work with children, to have these conversations with families, um, whatever the role, our role is in our day-to-day -day interactions with them, but to try to have these conversations so that they prepare ahead of time in terms of what are the next steps that we take to prepare to protect our children in these situations. Um, and because children are so dependent on their parents, um, oftentimes their daily activities can be disrupted. This can create behavioral challenges um, and distress, which can exacerbate the overall coping ability of the family and caregivers, which can make them more susceptible to abuse um, as well. So depending on, you know, the disability that the child um, is, it has, there are unique challenges that are associated with each of these. Uh, but children with limited mobility, um, you know, they might not be able to operate their wheelchair independently. Um, and so we need to have some sort of idea or plan in place of how we're going to account for that, or if it's a power um, an electric wheelchair, what other backups do, are we going to have available um, in those situations? Um, communication disorders can often affect how a, children, a child becomes aware of the disaster, how they understand the disaster, their ability to cope with the disaster and to ask for help um, in those situations. Um, and particularly, you know, just specifically to bring up an example, children with autism spectrum disorder are particularly vulnerable because in these situations where there's a natural disaster, whether it's anticipated or unexpected, there's a high level of stimulation that's going on um, in these types of emergency situations that can exacerbate distress and decrease cooperation. Um, and so make it more challenging to evacuate or remove the child from the situation. Same as with an adult um, that might be you know, in that same circumstance. Um, so just to kind of, in terms of understanding overall impacts, there isn't a lot of research, again, um, done in this area. Uh, but what I have found is that um, in general, um, you know, whether it relates to COVID-19 or um, just in general when it comes to relating to, you know, the experience of natural disasters, parental burnout is a huge factor and a huge um a, a huge challenge or barrier that um, we as 
a system in, in, in institutions that support um, you know, families or individuals with developmental disabilities have to be aware of. Um, and how can we best support some of that, that this, the challenges and the stress that they might be experiencing, they already experience from day to day and more so in a crisis situation. Um, when it comes to school preparedness, um, you know, most schools tend to have emergency plans in place of some kind. Um, and about three quarters of US schools have an evacuation plan um, that explicitly includes provisions for children with special needs. Um, but almost one quarter had no disaster plan for children with special needs at all. Um, and one quarter reported having no plans for post disaster counseling. Um, and about half had never met with local ambulance officials to discuss any sort of disaster relief or preparation. Um, although it's been found that urban schools tend to be better prepared than rural districts, um, I think we need to be more intentional when it comes to planning ahead, um, not only within the community settings, but within the school settings as well. Um, in terms of best practices, you know, there are, um, there, this is evolving, um, and this is an area that is growing, but there's not a lot out there. Um, and so again, providing accurate um, access to transportation, uh, providing information in ways that are easily understood by uh, people with disability, um, making sure that the person has their medical needs and the supplies that they need ahead of time, you know, accounted for if there were a situation um, or emergency to arise. Um, you know, um, making sure that the government doesn't always rely on outsourcing. Um, so oftentimes saying, okay, well, you know, the nonprofit or, or the private uh, sector will kind of take care of this situation uh, because that doesn't necessarily mean that all of their, um, you know, rights are going to be taken into account. Um, and so it's important to, you know, really advocate. And I think advocacy is really uh, the main point of all of this is that we continue to advocate for, um, and for planning and um, in terms when it comes to response pre and post um, natural disasters, uh, particularly for um, our vulnerable population. Um, you know, it's important that there are certain things that the person with a disability knows and has clear when, if a situation were to arise. One of them would be what their plans are to communicate and coordinate with their individual support network. Another would be to establish a buddy system, whether it's a neighbor, a coworker, somebody that they can easily gravitate to when it comes to evacuation having sufficient food, water, medication, and supplies available, um, particularly during and after, uh, during the recovery, and identifying evacuation methods and any sort of medical resources or shelters ahead of time that can accommodate that person's specific disability. Um, so in terms of um, post-disaster, I think one of the main takeaways um, is that sometimes overall adjustment and coping can be overlooked um, in people with intellectual and dis developmental disabilities. And oftentimes supports are not offered or tailored to people that have certain um, limitations. And so how do we create more awareness, you know, not only at the individual, level, but also at the systemic level that these are specific needs that need to be met um, in terms of creating, um, you know, if we're striving for inclusion, then this is something that needs to be, you know, thought, thought and planned for ahead of time. Um, and so part of that planning ahead of time is relates to having an evacuation plan in place, whether the person if, the, if they live in a residential facility, then this is likely taken care of by the facility staff. However, if they don't, they might live with a roommate or independently, or maybe even with an elderly parent 
what is the evacuation plan going to look like? Um, you know, although because it may be difficult, particularly can you imagine someone who has a developmental disability and maybe an elderly caregiver that might have their own limitations. Um, so if there's a plan in place, it's more likely that the person is going to follow that plan. And that plan is frequently revisited and discussed. They're more it's more likely to be a more automatic response. Um, making sure that we identify local resources um, you know, that can support this evacuation plan is going to be important. Um, and just making sure that, um, you know, that in that moment, the person might experience distress. They might feel overwhelmed and may not always, you know, react as we expect them to or make the decision to evacuate. Some of them might not want to leave their homes because they don't want to leave their comfort zone, their space, you know, go to a place that's unknown and, you know, go to going to a shelter that might be very anxiety provoking for them. So maybe having them exposing them ahead of time to the location that they will be going to. Ultimately, if it's with um, a trusted friend or family member, or whether it's going to a specific location, finding what that specific location is, talking to the person about that, what they can expect, maybe having them, um, you know, visit the place ahead of time will help decrease some of that anxiety as well. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Again, having the, that personal emergency evacuation plan, um, and this plan can be kind of altered and revisited, you know, as often as necessary. Um, it's important that the per this is something that the person is familiar with. We don't just introduce it one time and then expect the person to know what to do. Um, and so having things and readdressing and asking them, you know, Okay, so do you know where, what medications you're going to need to take or pack? Do you know what you're going to need to, you know, for your daily living needs? Um, anything that you might need to help you feel comfortable and self-soothe, anything that helps you communicate, any sort of important medical documents or information, um, anything that would be helpful for a person to know and having all of this information in one spot, or maybe they can just grab that envelope you know, and knowing that this is their bag or this is the place um, where they can locate all of this and not having them try to triage and locate it in the moment of, um, of stress. Um, and so in terms of post-disaster, again, um, you know, there are going, we have to consider, um, you know, once a disaster has passed, is there not only finding a, a place that's accessible to a person with whatever their varying disability might be, but also post-disaster, what if they can't go back into their home? What is going to happen at that point if there's a tornado or there's a flood that happens and that person's home living situation is no longer available to them at that point in time? What is the backup plan? And having that backup, backup plan clearly articulated and discussed is going to help facilitate um, that process when it's actually happening. Um, so that's that's pretty much uh, the gist of what I wanted to cover. There's so much more um, <laughs> that I would have loved to talk about, but um, you know, ultimately uh, due to time constraints, um, it's not possible, but I, I, there's so much to do in this area. There's so much awareness and attention um, that needs to be brought to light. Um, when it comes to supporting, um, you know, people with developmental disabilities in these very strenuous and very challenging situations. Um, and I think we need to continue these conversations and creating as much awareness as possible. So I appreciate your attention and your time. Um, and I look forward to being able to um, continue these conversations in the future. Have a good evening, everybody.